Hi, my name is Mateo Lewis. And I'm Lily Liebrach. And this is... Music Theater Theory Oh! So today we're doing something that um, I've never done before on this channel, but I've always wanted to do, which is I have a guest on. So uh, Lily is a friend of mine from Sheridan, so we're in each other's social bubbles, and the song that I wanted to analyze today is The Light in the Piazza from The Light in the Piazza, with music and lyrics by Adam Gettle. And I thought, you know, this song is supposed to be sung by like a classical soprano, and even though I've sung a lot of like girl songs in my octave on this channel before, this song, I just feel like I wouldn't be able to do it justice. But, do you know who could do it justice? Is Lily Libra, because she's got the most incredible voice, and I can't wait for you all to listen to her sing. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. So a little bit about The Light in the Piazza, it basically is about this American mother and daughter who vacation in Florence, Italy. And the daughter is in her mid-twenties, but when she was a kid, she got kicked in the back of the head by a horse. And now she has developmental issues, so mentally she's still at the age of a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old or however old she was when she got yeah. kicked. And she meets this boy in Italy, Fabrizio is his name, originated on Broadway by Matthew Morrison, who you all know from Glee. And so they fall in mad, passionate love with each other, even though they don't really speak each other's languages very well, and they don't really know each other. It's just kind of the first time that they've fallen in love. And the whole show explores the difference between infatuation and obsession, and love and where those two concepts are the same and where they're not. So this song is sung by Clara, the daughter, to her mother to try and explain to her mother why it's so important for her to be with Fabrizio. And it starts the mother and the daughter are in a big fight and the mother slaps her across the face and we get this piano. Already you can hear this entire musical is so classically influenced. The voice leading in the entire song and in the entire score of the show is so remarkable. Here are these first couple chords. We have this, this broken chord, and then these two notes each move up a semitone and the other three stay exactly the same. It turns into and this turns into... So these, these two notes in the left hand, it's two notes the entire time, two voices that lead us slowly, gradually, surely to the D major center that we land in. And this is such an interesting way of illustrating this character's kind of reeling. After being slapped in the face by her mother, she has a moment of what just happened, and then she lands in this place of... where she's like, no, 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 I know exactly what I need to tell you so that you understand what I'm feeling. So after that intro, the song starts like this. I don't see a miracle shining from the sky That's not what I think about, that's not what I see, I know what the sun can be. So again, this voice leading is so beautifully done. I should also define the term voice leading. That term doesn't refer to the, the voice, like the actual physical human voice. Mm -hmm. It refers to the voices within the harmonic structure of the piano part or of the orchestral part. I think it actually specifically comes from choral writing. Mm. When you have one chord that moves to another chord, especially in choral writing, each singer is only singing one note in each chord. So you want to make it so that each singer has a individual part that feels melodic so that it's easy for the singer to sing and natural for the singer to sing. So if I'm going from D major, like D F sharp 
to G major. G, B, D. So it looks like that. So the bass would be singing la la, and the alto would be singing la la, and the soprano would be singing la la. So all these singers have these big jumps. But a G major chord is any chord involving the notes G, B, and D. It doesn't have to be in that order. So if instead of going G, B, D, I flip it so the D is at the bottom, that's called inverting the chord, I can have D, G, B in that order instead. And if I go to this inversion from D major, I go from D, F sharp, A to D, G, B which means that the bass goes D, D. The bass just needs to go la, la, super easy. The alto goes la, la, super easy. And the soprano goes la, la, also super easy. And it feels much better to the ear as well because we're not hearing all these discombobulated jumps. Mm -hmm. So really good voice leading literally leads the ear through each chord and uses the relationships of the notes between the chord that comes before and the notes that come later and picks an inversion of the chord that is the most natural, that is the easiest to get to from the place that we were. And this section does that so well. We have these relatively simple chords. That's D6, F sharp minor, B minor 7, F sharp minor 7, and then E minor 11. But we don't just play D6, F sharp minor, B minor 7, F sharp minor 7, E minor 11, disjointed from each other. Adam Gettle has written four voices in the piano part that take us from each chord to the next in a really satisfying way. For example, the bass goes... Da na 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 na. Yeah. <laughs> Which is such a satisfying melody for the bass to be singing. If I was the bass in that choir, I would enjoy singing that melody. And this entire song has such good voice leading in that way, where every note leads really naturally and beautifully into the respective note from the next chord. Now before we go into this refrain section where she starts singing the light, the light in the piazza, there's one thing I want to point out going into that section. So this light in the piazza section comes in three times in the course of the song. And each time it's preceded by a ringing D in the left hand. And that D gets lower and lower. So this time it's... I know what the sunlight can be. D. And then it will get lower and lower as the song goes on to give it more resonance and gravitas. If you watch my video on Safer from First Date from last week, I talk about how, you know, the simplest thing of moving the left hand of the piano part down the octave makes the entire sound of the piano so much fuller. So if you haven't watched that video, go check it out because it's the exact same thing is happening here. In a very classically influenced piece, where Safer from First Date is a very pop influenced piece, but they use that same technique. I know what the sunlight can be. There's the D. The light, the light in the piazza. Tiny, sweet, and then it grows, and then it fills the air. Who knows what you call it? So that's the first instance of that the light, the light in the piazza, that section. Then we get this really interesting section that is a nightmare to play on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't even want to talk about it. It's just, it just, it's just so strange, but it sounds so cool because he uses so many notes from completely different key signatures, but they all lead comfortably back into the D major section at the end. So we get, first of all, where is this E flat coming from? We're in D major. There's no E flat in D major. And then this chord comes in that has one, two, three notes that are not from the key signature. But it leads us 
back down to that D, which is in the key signature, and then this chord, which is 100% in the key of D. So that's actually an example of voice leading. This is one chord in the right hand, and then it changes to in the right hand. Not in D major, and then in D major. And this is the power of really good voice leading because you can take notes that don't fit in the key whatsoever and if you voice lead them in a satisfying way back to the key, it feels like, oh, okay, you knew what you were doing all along. I was, I was worried for a second, but you figured it out. You got back to home eventually. And that allows us to use notes from outside the key signature that have a really specific and interesting flavor without getting the downside of using notes outside of the key signature, which is that they sound disconnected from the rest of the musical vocabulary. I have a question. Good question. So would you say that voice leading with the notes that aren't in the key signature, would you call that contrasting? Would you call that conflict? Like, mm. what would you call that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that it adds a lot of... I think the word the word that that I would use musically is tension. Mm. Music is so much about tension and release and tension and release and that's why like this mm. is so satisfying yeah. because oh that note's not supposed to be in that chord and then and then it releases it resolves, yeah. right? And so if I'm playing in D major and then I use a chord that's totally out of the key signature that makes it feel very very tense right yeah. like but then if I move this chord in a in a natural way back to D major there's a there's a release right you went yeah hmm you yeah. know there was like a sigh yeah because there is this tension that's built up and then I guess it makes the audience want it more. It's sort of like when you finish on a perfect fifth and you're like, ah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> when you finish on the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes the audience really want that release. And so much of the way that music affects you is by building up tension to a specific release, and then if it gives you a release that you weren't expecting, or a release that was better than you were expecting, that's when it really, really, when music just hits your soul and you can't, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, and all the character wants is a release, you know, like she wants that solution, so the tension makes sense because life isn't easy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. No. yeah, that's so right, yeah. <laughs> Where were we? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go... favorite parts of this song because it, it plays with that idea of tension and release. Mm, I felt it there. <laughs> this, the second part of that phrase is something we've heard all the time. We've heard that. We know that sound. Do T. That semitone release is something we're very familiar with. Usually it's with so in the bass, which turns it into a suspended chord and then a major chord. So the suspended chord is where the tension comes from, yeah. and then the major chord is the release that we are yearning for. Adam Gettle kind of says, I like the concept, but I'm going to do it a totally different way. So he throws out the, the so in the left hand, so it's no longer a so chord, but it still has the same voices in it, and then he adds this... E flat before it, so it goes instead of just D C sharp, it goes E flat D C sharp. So there's even more 
tension and release. There are two sections of tension and release. It starts, that's a weird chord, I don't like it, and then, ah, uh, there, that's a chord I like, and then, oh, that's a chord I like even more. It's the same concept as this, that we all love so much, but it just expands it a little bit more and pulls it out so that the tension is really, really palpable. And then the D comes back in, now down here, and we get back into the light in the piazza section. That's all I see. And then here's the D. So the first part of that section is a repeat of what we've already heard, you know, from the light, the light, the piazza, and then we get this, we get this again, which we've heard before, um, now it's up the octave, which gives it a little bit more float, then we hear this crazy voice leading that we've heard before, to D. The first thing that's a big difference that I really, really love. The first time she sings it, she goes, The second time she sings it, she goes, Who knows what you call it? But it's there! Then loop, It is there! And in the piano we get something new on this, It is there! That we didn't have before. And it's so interesting. F sharp, that's the major third, right? That's me in the key of D major, me, re, do. That's do, that's D. But what Adam Gettle does is he has this like F natural, which is the minor third, and then lifts up into this major third. And it's it's the same feeling as um, as a major chord, but it just takes us a split second to get there. So we just want it so badly, and then we get it. Oh. Oh, it's so good. It's so good, man. Oh. <laughs> then, this is the craziest, like, ten bars of music I've ever seen. <laughs> oh. explain why. So this is the best use of tuplets, weird tuplets that I've ever heard. So Lily, do you know what a tuplet is? See, I thought you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready. Hey, I know what a triplet is. Mm -hmm. A tuplet. So what's a triplet? A triplet is when you have um, three notes and they're connected and they're all even. Mm -hmm. So you'd have like Ta, ta, ta. Yes. Kind of yes. Yeah. Exactly. Three evenly spaced out notes, usually in the space of what would otherwise be two notes. Right. So if this is the rhythm. One, two. One, two. The triplet is. Three. 
three evenly spaced out notes that take the same amount of time as these two. And a tuplet is five, or six, or seven, or eleven, or thirteen evenly spaced out notes. Cool. Tuplets are basically a way of writing polyrhythms, which is just X number of evenly spaced out notes in the same span of time as Y number of evenly spaced out notes. If you want a really good example of what a complex polyrhythm looks like, I will link a video in the description below that is a person playing a 7-11 polyrhythm, so seven notes over 11 notes in the same span of time. Is it Jacob Collier? It's not. Uh-huh. Shocking. It, um, <laughs> I found it, though, <laughs> because uh, Jacob Collier, I think, mentioned it or something, or he okay. did a... Or he did like a polyrhythm that was like 24 to 25. We live for Jacob weird. Collier. We live for Jacob Collier. We live for him. Everyone go look at Jacob Collier if you haven't already. Yeah, so there's this, there's this person doing a 7-11 polyrhythm at a 7-11. And I think that that's hilarious. Um, so I'm going to link it in the description. <laughs> um, so that section of the piano part uses tuplets to create the feeling of discombobulation that Clara is experiencing and the constantly heightening anxiety of this feeling that she doesn't quite understand and doesn't know how to process the confusion and the excitement and all of the parts of love that are not easy, the parts of love that are really scary and exciting but anxiety inducing, tuplets create that feeling because they speed up. If you have like one second and you put five notes evenly spaced out in that second, they will each take up a fifth of a second. Mm -hmm. But if you put seven notes in that span, so if you increase the number of the tuplet, each note has to be squeezed a little bit tighter in order to fit in the same beat. So seven tuplets go faster, or set tuplets I think is the I call them seven tuplets, oh. which I think is wrong. <laughs> so seven tuplets would have to squeeze a little bit tighter within that beat. Right. So they move faster than quintuplets or five tuplets. The beat stays exactly right. the same, and the number of notes that get squished into the same beat, so the, the number of the tuplet is right. what changes. So cool. It goes from five to six to seven, and then back to six. Just such a creative way of doing that. Who comes up with yeah. this? It's, it's mind-boggling to me. So let me break it down really slowly. It sounds like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> So let me play that for you and see if you can hear it. It's really interesting. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. That sounds like. Feel that? How there's this expansion in those five tuplets, this like... There's like an expansion there. And then in this set tuplet section, this like heightened anxiety of squeezing too many notes into the same space. And then it relaxes. And there's that... Minor, major, again. down the octave, all the way down here. The first time it was here, then it was here, and now it's all the way down here to give it the most resonance possible and the most grounded feeling of coming to the end of this song.
Hey, respect. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so one last thing I want to point out here. We've heard the light in the piazza. We've heard that melody a billion times with the same chords. There's one thing different in those chords this last time, which is so beautiful to me. Before it was always the light, the light in the piazza. And it ends on this E minor chord with this G in it. Now, at the end of the song, it goes the light, the light in the piazza. This E major chord with this G sharp in it, which is so beautiful to me. It's just so much more hopeful and so much more honest. The fact that we've been landing here at the end of that section every single time feels like there's still conflict there. But then this, it just, it feels like a burden is lifted. It's so lovely. And then, we, we're not quite there yet because we're still, even though it's this lovely major chord, it's not on the tonic, you know? It's not home bass. It's up here. And then the way that he leads us back to D is so smart. So it's E major, and then it, uh, they add a D in the chord. And the singer sings a C sharp. So the singer's singing this note. The piano's playing this note. Which is, there's so much tension there. And then the singer resolves to the D finally. So the singer goes, my love. But the chord doesn't land, my love. The chord lands, my love. Tension, 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 tension. And then this G and this B flat converge together to become that A, which fills out this D major chord. The piano is holding this E7 with the singer holding this really dissonant C sharp. And then the singer resolves to the D, but the piano takes another couple beats to get there. And then we land and it's just the most satisfying ending of all time because we've been through this ride of high notes and tuplet changes and dissonant voice leading and now finally we come to rest at this 100% just pure D major chord and it is just the most satisfying feeling in the world. So that's the light in the piazza from the light in the piazza. If you like this video, subscribe, share it with all your friends, and leave a comment telling me what you want to see me talk about next. I was gonna say, can we sing through the whole thing for fun? Do you want to just sing through for the fun. whole thing? Yeah. yeah. Why not? All right. Let's do well, that. thank you for watching. Stick around to see Lily perform the entire song flawlessly because she's amazing.
Thanks for watching. Have Thanks a fantastic day. Music theater theory. Oh.